rage uh, more than the others. Uh, and pictures, of course. And these are the books of Anelda, rather substantial collection of books. And here we have a collection of essays and another collection of essays and a new novel, which uh, is complete. So uh, from Anelda, the work will continue. And that is, I think, is perhaps the most exciting aspect of it, that from Anelda will be part of it. Emmanuel 
flavor is often the fate of the high school dropout. And it was from Nelson's as well. Doug Ditches worked as a butcher's apprentice. Truman learned firsthand the rigors of the work of life. The collapse of the nation's economy in 1929 sensitized Truman to the inequities of the capitalist system. And he became entranced with the goals of the Communist Party. Much to the dismay of his parents, New England Republicans to the core, Truman subscribed to the daily worker, the dirty worker. Their beloved son had crossed into another world. Political activism and romance fused with his first marriage to Helen Hodgkin, a woman ten years older than him. She became pregnant. This was a time of depression. And in a tragic circumstance, she died as a result of a failed abortion. Despair and anger flowed within him, and he found new evidence. Support his rage as the existing political order. With the New Deal, the Works Progress Administration, Truman had found some support for his vast intellectual energy and gifts of mimicry and eloquence. Teaching night school courses of literature, he and other fellow graduates from the public library, such as Vincent Farini, were able to refine their skills. But it was acting that he saw as his vehicle. His magnificent voice and handsome presence led him to acting jobs in Boston and Provincetown. In Provincetown, then he met Elizabeth Hendrick, daughter of a successful lace curtain Irish Catholic lawyer, my mother. The combination of his handsome bearing and his tragic personal history was irresistible, and they married. They moved to New York City, and together they worked with Orson Welles' Mercury Theater, while his wife, Betty, took leads in production of the Federal Theater. But however, factionalism within the left led to a departure from New York, and the couple returned to land. The Second World War had begun in Europe, but the United States had yet to become involved. Truman and Betty set up their home in eight called Boston Street in Milan. Truman went to work for the General Electric Company and began to write a play. It was a time of powerful playwrights. Sean O'Casey in Ireland, Gene O'Neill in the Clifford Odets in the United States. At last, the actor could speak in his own words as a playwright, as well as in his own voice. Working the second shift at General Electric from 3 to 11 at night, Truman would return home. A12 Boston Street, the lead of poetry and salon, of writers and poets and actors and dancers and painters and political activists, all the way to regular jobs, but at night they became these wondrous beings. It was a heady time for the young couple. With the involvement of the United States in the Second World War, Truman was assigned to defense work and became more deeply committed to the shop steward, the United Electrical Workers Union. At night he would entertain his friends and write his plays. It was during the war that his two children were born, Garrison in 1942 and Abigail in 1944. Garrison was named for Newbury Forts, owned William Lloyd Garrison, statue of Blanca Williams. The nation's single most important voice against slavery. Abigail was named for Abigail Kelly, an associate of Garrison in the anti slavery movement. <coughs> With the end of the war against fascism and Nazism, it was hoped that a saner world order could be created. But it was not to be. The wartime alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union disintegrated into the prolonged Cold War, which continues today. Truman's marriage to Betty ended, and he married another Helen, who was sailor. His work at the GE continued, but he changed his vehicle of literary expression. Novel. It was during this time that he came under the tutelage of Harvard's F. O. Matheson, an expert on the pre Civil War American Renaissance. The raw talent and vibrant energy of Truman's benefit from Maddie Geithner, and the first novel gained a publisher in Boston, Little Brown. But Maddie did not 
get to see the book where he was a victim of the Ice and Red Scare and a deeply harassed and distressed Temple Mathis leaped to his death before the publication of his book. This book, Sin of the Prophet, told the story of the Anthony Burns case. It was set in 1854, the time of the Fugitive Slave Act. Burns was captured by federal marshals in Boston and was to be remanded to the South to return to slavery. The abolitionists gathered at Fennel Hall, the birthplace of resistance and tyranny of the British Crown. Their leader was Theodore Parker, the city's leading minister, and the grandson of Captain John Parker, the man who led Mexican farmers into battle against the British at the time of the shock heard around the world. Dero Parker had a bay of nerve after rousing the Fannel Hall crowd into direct action. <coughs> action which never came. Dero Parker's sin was the failure to follow his words with deeds, the failure to put his theory into practice. The Boston intellectuals had failed where the Lexington farmers had succeeded. A year later, the passion by the book appeared. This book dealt with the failure of the communal movement for farm. Once again, New England's literary and criminal intellectuals had failed to deliver on their high-minded promises. Their inability to solve questions of property and sexual relationships doomed their well embroidered scheme. It was during the writing of the third book, The Fall of the Word, which was to be about Wendell Phillips, another of Boston's eloquent intellectuals. The Truman encountered the presence of the single most important figure in his writing, John Brown. John Brown was a deeply religious, Bible quoting farmer from upstate New York. Like the Nelsons of Linfield, John Brown was a farmer, a farmer of unyielding soil. Makes you tough. And like the Nelsons of Linfield, John Brown knew not much about Shakespeare's plays or the social theories of Fourier, but he knew what was right, and he knew what was wrong. And he knew that slavery was wrong, and what was even more wrong was to know of its evils and to do nothing about it. John Brown's experiences in Kansas are recounted in Truman's largest book, The Surveyor. John Brown oversaw the execution of five men affiliated with the border ruffians who wished to extend, extend the domain of the slave power across the Mississippi, across the Missouri River, where it had not existed before. Truman and I traveled to Kansas in 1954, and here he found evidence of the fact that these individuals were not the innocents described in the definitive history texts, but members of a kangaroo court designed to drive the free state men out of Kansas. Brown's violent act polarized the nation, and it became clear that a bloody civil war was inevitable. Anti-slavery words and speeches were not going to free the slaves. Direct action against the slaveocracy was the only route. For Truman, this commitment to John Brown changed the course of his life. During the 1950s, his activist energies had been spent on historic preservation of the places and buildings revered by the pre-Civil War New England intellectuals, places such as Thoreau's Walden Farm. But after the surveyor, Truman's activism took a far more risky turn. In Monroe, North Carolina, a group of blacks led by Robert Williams had opened fire on the Ku Klux Klan, which had sought to intimidate them in their time-honored fashion of terror. Williams led the resistance, and Truman's pamphlet, People with Strength, and his essay, The Resistance Spirit, Williams' book, Negroes with Guns, signaled the move away from his identification with New England's well-meaning but ultimately ineffectual literary figures toward an alliance with those who would take direct action against oppression. His involvement spread into opposition to American isolation in Cuba and to a wide range of government policies. 1960s, as we recall, were a time of racial confrontation and urban riots that led to a massive hatred between blacks and the white police force. The 
summer of 1964, the death of a white shopkeeper in Harlem led to the arrest and imprisonment of six young blacks. The police brutalized the young boys, and the incident was a major spark to ignite the Harlem race riots of that year. Testimony of the boys and their mothers was gathered by Truman, put together in his book, Torture of Mothers. Because no major publisher, publisher would touch this book, he published it here in Newburyport under the imprimatur of the Garrison Press. It was at this time that Truman had moved to Newburyport to live with Anne and her two children, Elizabeth and John Perry. It was also at this time that he rediscovered William Lloyd Garrison. The Torture Mothers was translated into German and Turkish. It sold thousands of copies at the one dollar each at stores throughout the nation's black ghetto. A powerful book which was later made into a film and a play. Its major impact, however, was to mitigate the life sentence against the boys and get them released from jail. He had become like Garrison, a man whose words had consequences. And it was during this time that he gave up his big novels wrote essays and pamphlets linking the emotional righteousness of the anti-slavery abolitionists of the 1850s to the anti-government protesters of the 1960s. His book, The Right of Revolution, argued as did John Locke in the Glorious Revolution of 1688, as the nation's founding fathers had in 1776, that a nation which failed to deliver rights to its citizens was not worthy this book was widely circulated throughout the anti-war and civil rights movements, and it eventually found its way to the desk of Ho Chi Minh. Not bad in the barber's lounge in Boston Street. The hopes of Truman for a basic transformation of American society failed to materialize, as Richard Nixon gained office. Black nationalism limited the involvement of whites in the fight against racism the de-escalation of the war in Vietnam had returned to college campuses for the quiet. The revolution was not going to occur, at least in his lifetime. In the 1970s, Truman's life changed again. The second book on John Brown, The Old Man, published by Holt Ryan Hoffman, This book dealt with Brown's assault on the federal arsenal of Harpersburg, Virginia, the event which more than any other had frightened the slaveocracy of the South into taking their direct action against the Federal Union. The book was widely reviewed at the time of direct action was passed. Confrontational politics no longer had their impact. It was during this time that Truman's life moved from the macro level thrust of societal change to a micro level awareness of the complexity of people's interpersonal relationships. It was during this time that Truman he had always been a speaker, and as a speaker, he had wonderful energy and an immense presence. But as a teacher, he had all of his time. No longer could he give thundering lectures, rich in literary illusion and literary eloquence. But now he had to learn to listen. Listening is the essence of teaching, for it is in the listening that one hears whether or not one student grasp the essence of your argument. It was involved it was involved with the Leslie College that made a profound difference. Recruited from the faculty of Ashanti and Nip, Truman came to know many graduate students in the Leslie program. And these women from the Leslie program who played the most important part in Truman's life for the past decade. These wonderfully bright, exciting, and creative women inspired Truman's writings and nourished during this past decade, Truman began work on God and Love, a novel for the development of the theories of John Humphrey Lloyd, a young Vermont minister trained at Yale in social and religious theories were exceedingly controversial in the 1840s and the 1980s as well. Noyes was a perfectionist, one who believed in perfectibility of individuals while they existed on Earth. 
nor is developed the concept of Bible communism, which called for the sharing of property, marriage promises, and promises. Unlike Brook Farm, which collapsed under the weight of property and sexual exclusivity, Moses Tompkins in Putney, Vermont, and later in United New York thrived. Noise was another man who had successfully combined theory and practice. This novel is now complete. Noise, unlike Parker, risked the censure of fellow citizens and translated his theory into action. And the community at Oneida survived for more than 40 years. It was during the writing of this book that Truman's capacity to listen led to his awareness of the issues confronting the women of America, conflicts surrounding their roles within society, mothers, daughters, wives, lovers, professionals, housewives. All of these, these conflicts had led to an emotional uprooting of contemporary women. The women in his life in the past decade, Polly, Christy, Anna, Miranda, Mariah, Judy, Jean, Marjorie, Debbie, Carol, Caroline, Leslie, and Katie sensitized him to these problems. And it was his capacity to listen, to advise, to console, to entertain, to inform, to encourage, to support, and most of all, to heal, which has made this the final decade of his life the richest of all of his eight decades on earth. Truman Nelson was my father. Not an easy act to follow. Not an easy man for a son to love. But it was during this decade that I learned to love him. For that joy which has given me, I thank the women of my father's house. The opportunity to spend three years working closely with him on his literary memorial to thank his wonderful constitution. For whatever gifts and talents I may possess, thank him for my mother. Good night, my comrade. May we do justice to your memory.
get together all the time. He was a man who loved people. He couldn't live without people. My father couldn't live without people. I can't live without people. Truman can't live without people. And I said something very strange the other day. I picked a room for a dead man. And it said, initiation and passage from the ashes to the Phoenix who flies forever, holding everything within his arms. As far as I'm concerned, there's no death. He lived with me and he's lived with all, all of you people who know him closely. We have memories. The memories are wonderful. But what I want to say is that there's something about the man who lived so intensely inside himself that he was able to allow people to come inside and he went inside them. To me, that's the only art that counts. Life is the art. And I've had quarrels with Truman, deep quarrels, but we've been steadfast all the way through because he allowed me to be as I allowed him to be, and in our interchanges, something always came up. And one woman, Elaine Wing, she got me. And she got me too. When I was comforting Judy upstairs, she was crying her heart out, and there was this portrait Loud, it was so loud as it is right here. It's louder than light. Well, there's a lot inside me. I love this man. This man will never die. All his family is inside me, all his friends inside me, and I will write about it. I feel very fortunate to be able to speak to you as one of the women who Truman loved, and as one of the women who loved Truman with all my heart and soul. You, my women friends out there, who composed this, this piece, I'm reading this for you, each of you know that. Thank you for letting me do it. And it goes, I come before you today to share some of the feelings and ideas of many of the people who love Truman, and probably hundreds and perhaps thousands of people who were profoundly changed because Truman knelt and touched our lives. We collectively know Truman as a revolutionary artist and fighter, a friend, a nurturer and a lover, and a man with the soul of a self-proclaimed 17-year-old poet. We all would agree that only Truman can speak for himself as a revolutionary artist. Truman was a Marxist, a revolutionary, and an artist. Here are some of the things he said and wrote about himself. I am now applying for Social Security. My monthly stipend will be $140. This could be devastating to think my ultimate income is so little. My only resource outside my writing is welfare. 
which would bring it up to $200 a month. But I feel honored by this. I am proud of the fact that I contributed eight revolutionary books without feeding any profit back into the system. A French Swiss philosopher that I spoke to once exposed me to a philosophy of selflessness in which you do not weigh things in material calculations. There is just enough art in my work to convince the publisher that it might make money, but there is enough morality in it to piss off the esthetes. When you have that sense that you have responded to the need of an ethic, then you feel that you have locked into some useful function. People have come to me and said that I have changed them. I do not want to be overly modest about this because changing people has been the purpose of my life. My discoveries have all come from the examination of human reactions and specific historical events. I consider myself to be a Marxist guided by the concepts of historical materialism. Marx didn't invent anything, he just discovered a way of explaining. My art is concerned with the revolutionary process and this revolutionary art is motivated by a desire to change American society. I am working toward an egalitarian world in which my art, which takes down the barriers between people and which sensitizes people to each other. One of Truman's dearest friends spoke for many of us when she wrote this. Truman held me with his arms, with his heart, and with his mind. And in that embrace, I was safe. And in his embrace, I grew to be more than I thought possible.
Truman was a man who lived with the magic of the extreme. He hated what he called the rotten center. He hated it. Nietzsche talked about the magic of the extremes. Truman wasn't crazy about him because perhaps he wasn't noble enough for Truman. Truman was an epic man. I feel gifted to be part of that epic, the epic of his life. Every moment that I was with Truman Nelson, I knew that I was part of an epic. He gave us all a story to tell. He never talked about himself, not too much. He wasn't interested in autobiography. Never really wrote about himself. 
show person should when the show isn't going well. And she panicked. She goes, well, this is his, these are his books. He liked these the best. And she went up to the shelf, got on a chair, sat, stood on his chair, got the books down, which was perfectly okay with Truman. Right. And uh, they're, they're, they do anything. Right. Tell just quickly how the, about his name. His name. Oh. One time I asked him, Truman, why is your name Truman? It's a pretty odd name, he said. Because I'm always true, so they call me a true man. And so... One time he said to me, you know, I'm never going to change anything in my house from the old pirate. And the next day I said, hey, Truman, that bathroom looks a little new. And he said, yeah, I got in it a couple weeks ago. And I said, but you said you never were going to change anything in your house. And your name is Truman. You want to sing with me? right now. All right. The show isn't going to last long, Lizzie. <laughs> I can't hold these. Come on. Okay. I'll sing one song. Right, and then I sang together. We were, this was the act song. How many of you remember the birthday parties and the, the two verses of Wayfaring Strangers? Raise your hands if you remember. I can't remember his verse. He wrote it. Uh, so I'm going to hum what I remember, don't remember, and sing what I remember of his verse. He wrote uh, the revolutionary part of this. Old black American. He really loved this song, so he sang it every year for seven years. I am a poor, wayfaring stranger, a traveling through.
Yeah. <laughs> 